scientist or anything like that. Um, I'm basically an aquaculturist or I consider a janitor as well. Um, <laughs> we're pretty successful with seahorses. Um, most people have a hard time with them. There's only a handful of people probably globally that can successfully raise a very high percentage of them. Uh, we finally have broken through and we do so. Uh, typically, I look for about anywhere from an 80 to 97% survival rate with most species. Um, 97 if I'm on top of them constantly with a lot of work, and if I do my normal routine and try to do multiple species and everything else I have to do, it's typically closer to about 80%. Um, Seahorses are different than most other fish. Um, they don't go through metamorphosis. They're, um, vertically orientated animals, which presents a little bit of a unique, different type of a swimming pattern. Um, they obviously, because of the upright posture, if you will, they require more energy to move around through the water. They're not as streamlined as a fish is. And they're not a perpetual swimmer, so they don't constantly swim. And you have to account for that as well. And they'll hitch when they're at rest. Um, as far as feeding them goes, Seahorses don't eat food whole and just swallow it. They macerate the food and they snick it. And that creates an issue in that when we do that, if you watch larger seahorses that you're feeding, say, a large piece of frozen mice, if you watch them, they look like a dragon almost with a blowing smoke out of the back of their head. And that's all organic matter going into the water column, which we have to account for. Um, they're also different in that they don't have a true stomach. It's, uh, consequence of that is that the food will have a tendency to move through the digestive tract rather quickly. Typically, we find that what goes in comes out roughly in about 10 hours. Um, the digestion is not complete, and that creates a, a problem in that, again, it contributes to the organic loading of the system, and of course, they eat a tremendous amount uh, to make up for it. And then the uh, one of the interesting things that I find is an article that was written some time ago called the Jawbone Hypotheses, where they talk about seahorses evolving where they don't have the gut associated lymphoid tissue that's found in many other animals. And this impacts us tremendously because seahorses have evolved where they eat live food out of the water column, which is basically clean, healthy food, if you will, where uh, other fish can come along, even other sick fish, and in the wild you'll see a sick fish doesn't last very long because somebody comes along and scavenges it. The gut associated with the tissue keeps them from getting sick. With seahorses, one of the big problems we have is that we don't feed them a natural diet in captivity. We feed them a lot of uh, frozen foods, and if frozen foods are left lying around in the tank, they can become colonized, and that creates an issue. Um, in terms of setting up a system for doing seahorses, there's, most people will probably use a recirculating system. Um, some people will start off with a static system, uh, where they, like a green water type system, they can rely on water changes to keep them going. We do strictly recirculating with where we are. Um, I wish I was in a position where I could have a flow through system, a place like Hawaii, where you have a constant supply of clean uh, seawater coming through. Um, and I really wish if I had that, I'd have, I would try to design some type of a hybrid system so that when the water quality does drop in the wild, I can flip back over to a recirculating. Okay, when we're setting up a seahorse system to r raise seahorses, um, first of all, we always try to start with a clean system. Uh, when we have the time and the, uh, the space to do so, we'll sterilize our system between batches of fry. And we'll start off with a recycle system. We either uh, have media that's already cycled, that's on standby, or we'll cycle the system with uh, clear ammonia, or um, sometimes we will buy the bacteria to load the system up and get it going. That's a very expensive way of doing it. Um, on your fry systems, they have to be able to handle a tremendous uh, bio load. Some of these systems that we have will have up to, the, the tank that you see there is about a, it's a 90 gallon tank when it's filled, that's about 75 to 80 gallons. And some of those systems I'll put up to a quarter of a pound of feed in per feed. So your filtration scheme has to be very, very good. Um, you want a variable flow rate, 
And the reason for that is, is during feedings, we don't want to flush all the food out. But ideally, after feedings are done, you can turn the flow back up and, and increase uh, with a round system like that, you, the cleaning capacity and put a lot better water back in. And of course, you want an easy to maintain system to cut down the workload and something that's absor observable. Um, when we first started, we started with rectangular tanks and we had a fair amount of success with those, but we found that by going to round tanks, we were able to do a whole lot better. Um, in a round tank, you get a more natural flow pattern, particularly in a larger tank, you can have the flow set, you have a slow turn going around there, around the tank, the flow is nice and even so you don't have any dead spots. And what happens with the seahorses, if you watch them closely in a round tank like that, they will line up into the flow and let the food come to them. They don't have to expend a lot of energy. And that increases our food conversion ratios. Um, and to some extent, a round tank will have a tendency, particularly when you turn the flow up, to move all the detritus on the bottom towards the center where it goes, to, where it's flushed out as opposed to us having to clean it out. Um, so it, it saves some of the work. And then I found that I can do much higher stocking densities in a round tank. Um, I get up to six, uh, sometimes as many as 700 seahorses that are anywhere from two to three and a half inches in one of those round tubs. Um, the rectangular tanks obviously have the advantage that they take up a whole lot less real estate. And that's a nice aspect, but the labor aspect, we found that the round tanks will make up for it. And then of course, the one thing I do like about glass tanks is that uh, you can't do with the round tanks if they're not see-throughs so and they're viewing is strictly from the top. <coughs> Um, a lot of people like to use Chrysler tanks with fry. We don't use them. Uh, we prefer the round tanks. And we don't have the issues with the, the floaters and stuff that most people have. And I'll cover that a little bit later. Um, the problem I have with both Chry Chrysler systems is typically they're very small. And when we're dealing with plastic fry, we're usually dealing with large batches. One of the read items that we had would dump 1,600 fry every time. And a small price will just doesn't cut it. We just do so much better with a bigger volume of water. Um, and then most people try to use the prices to keep the float, the seahorses from floating on the surface. And the idea is that the price system, the constant circulation will bring them back down. Um, that's preventable. Um, and the problem, I, the problem I have with that type of a design is seahorses are programmed to go up to the surface to feed on the zooplankton. And in many of the cases where I've seen Chrysler setups and I've looked at what people have, they have the flow so strong, they're constantly pushing the fry down, the fry are trying to go back up, and they're essentially wasting a lot of energy and exhausting themselves in the Chrysler setup. Uh, the, another problem that I see with most common hobbyist type Chrysler setups is the water exchange. This picture here I took off the internet of someone who had a uh, setup, and you can see in the picture where he's got the screening on the side, and he's gotten submerged. The problem with that is, is that it doesn't have enough water flow to it uh, for water exchange. Um, the price systems, most of them are much more difficult to clean than a big, nice open tank, and the flow pattern we already talked about. Um, with a round tub, it's kind of hard to see in this picture, but most of the fry here are orientated so they're facing the current where they're eating. And with this type of a flow pattern, they, they look like they're almost just sitting there, slowly going backwards, just facing the food and eating. Um, they require a whole lot less energy to do that than in a square tank where that has a lot of flow um, for a Chrysler system. And with this type of a tank, it's very easy for us to clean it because it's all open. And a lot of it is kind of self-cleaning because of the detritus, the particularly turn the flow up, goes to the center. And in the center, uh, there's, there's a drain pipe. And over the drain pipe, I get a lot of questions about this, is a sleeve. And the sleeve is simply a two-inch pipe with uh, straight couplings on the end that we cut out and put screening material on it. And depending upon the size of the fry we're dealing with, what size we put on it. And of course, what I really like about this is the larger volume of water. When you're looking at, at tank size, with small tanks, the obvious advantage is a lower initial cost. 
And we started off using much smaller tanks. Typically, 15-gallon tanks were fry. But we now, we're at the point, even if I only have 50 or 100 fry, I still like using the 90-gallon tubs. Um, the uh, disadvantage, of course, with bigger tanks is it takes more food, and the smaller tanks take a whole lot less. And if you're doing a, a static system, it's obviously easier for the water changes. But for me, what I really like is the stability of the larger tanks and the fact that I don't have to every week or two weeks divide up the fry. Um, the first couple of times we had success, we found that after a week or so, we had to divide up the fry into another system or another tank. A couple of weeks after that, we had to divide them up again. Next thing you know, the fact that one time I had over 130 gallon tanks were for fry, and it was just a nightmare trying to keep up with. Um, I can do the same thing as those 100 gallon, uh, 130 gallon tanks with about a dozen round tanks. Um, one of the disadvantages, of course, of using a larger tank is having to put more food in, but that also creates the advantage that I don't have to, to come along as often to keep up with the food density, particularly in, you know. When you have a small tank of a high stocking density, they're going to consume the food right quickly. And then I also like with the larger tanks, adjusting the flow to get the pattern of flow that I want and the volume of, of the turning in the tank, if you will. Um, it's much easier with a larger volume of water. We do use some smaller tubs that are around uh, 18 gallons, but I find that they're more difficult to control the flow than the larger volumes of water. For filtration with seahorse tanks, you have to take into account that these guys consume large amounts of food. In nature, they're uh, what I call grazers. They're constantly on the lookout for food. We feed probably somewhere between five to seven times a day, and it's a tremendous amount of food. The, they also macerate their food, the digestion, and then the, the type of food we feed is high in proteins and fats. So we have to take all this into account for setting up our filtration scheme. The way we like to do our systems, they're pretty simple actually. But first we like to use a filter sock, and the smaller the mesh, the better. We use that to capture any of the uneaten artemia that goes through the system into the sump. And in the evenings, whatever's not eaten, we want to turn the flows up and flush the system of any uneaten artemia, which is going to lose its nutritional value. The same thing if you're using rotifers. And we try to catch it in a filter sock as much as possible. We typically have that over some blue bonded media, which reflects some more stuff. And then I like using bio balls for degassing as well as a biological media. Uh, my systems are real small, which I'll show you a picture of in a moment. Uh, I wish I had a taller column of the bio balls for the degassing aspect. Uh, protein skimmers to me are a necessary item to have on any seahorse tank, including fry tanks. If you saw how much stuff we pull out of a fry system, it, it would blow your mind. And with protein skimmers, you really have to stay up on them. Uh, we change, uh, change, we clean ours daily. And the reason for that is as soon as that riser tube, the neck, whatever you want to call it, gets dirty, most skimmers start losing their efficiency. Typically anywhere from 25 to 50 percent. Um, depending upon the design. So our, our routine is to clean the protein skimmers every day. And in some of my systems, I'll pull up to an inch of gunk out in a day to give you an idea of how much we pull. Um, for the primary biological filtration, we use what's called a low space bioreactor. Ours are homemade. Um, the, the advantage of those is for a small, tight space, um, they, they can handle a very, very high bio load. And then after we've gone through all of that, we then have micron canisters. All of our fry systems, in fact, all of our seahorse tanks have a five micron canister filter. And to give you an idea of how much organics is in a tank, we have to change those daily. They clog up. And to give you an idea, my saltwater tower, which is a 550 gallon tower with clean uh, saltwater in it, I can run a one micron filter and, cha and change it out about every three to four months. But these tanks with the five pipe filters, they just, it just blows my mind how fast they clog up with all the crap. Uh, we also use what's called an oxidator. Some of you may have heard of those, many of you don't. They were designed for koi ponds. And what they are is a device that has peroxide in them with a, a catalyst. And what the catalyst does is it slowly reacts with the peroxide. And as the air expands in there, it forces small amounts into the water. 
And essentially, it was what I call a, a, a poor man's ozone machine. And it, it helps keep the water clear. Every bit of the stuff that we can oxidize is something we don't have to filter out. Um, and then <clears throat> we also use probiotics. We have to use Invase probiotic. And it's really not part of the filtration scheme, but it's used in conjunction with the filtration scheme and trying to keep the organics down and keep the system healthy. There's a uh, picture, of, typically it's one of our sumps that's actually a 20 long. Um, it's really very simple in design. The uh, water comes in, you see the white pipe on the uh, right side coming down. There's a 150 micron bag that's uh, got a zip tie on it that collects the artemia. Uh, that's sitting on top of the blue bottom media and the bio balls. The skimmers, I like to run for at least twice the biggest volume of water. Um, that one was just cleaned. Um, and then behind the post, you can't see it very well, is my low space bioreactor. For those of you who are not familiar with them, they're essentially a, um, they're designed to have a flow of water through them. They have what's called K1 Caldus media in them. And, what I've done is I've taken, being cheap, I take uh, the water bottles you get uh, spring water in, typically two and a half gallons for that size sump, and just fill it about uh, anywhere from a third to half full of K1 Collins media, drill some holes in the side, and just let it churn. The, the, the media floats, and as the water comes in from the top, it just simply keeps it churning, and that filter will handle a tremendous amount of uh, bio. The larger sumps that I have are typically like a 30 uh, breeder. Um, I'll, I'm able to put a five gallon jug in those and increase the, the amount of biological capacity. And then if you look to the, the top right of that picture, you see the uh, canister filter, and those are snow white when we put them in. We also use live mice in our cultures. Um, live mice. <laughs> are a, a great way of trying to help keep the tank clean. When we started using them, we started noticing an increase in success right away. Um, they act as part of the cleanup crew. They eat the same thing as the fry, so they're easy to take care of. The disadvantage to that, of course, is that you have to uh, put more food in the system to account for them. Uh, but you'll notice that when you have a system like that, the tanks are much, much cleaner. Uh, one of the disadvantages of the uh, the live mice, if, you, if you're one who doesn't keep up with the feedings, if the mice get hungry, they will go after the fry. Um, and our systems are fed so well, it's a very, very rare occurrence. And the benefits outweigh the cons there. Um, the fry will start eating monopoli once they start getting bigger. Um, and then when they start going after the adults, which is fun to watch, we start putting in the frozen food. I was talking last night with the fun things to watch is when you watch uh, most of the mice disappear, there's two or three left that are the, the good uh, survivors to watch them being chased around the tank by several hundred seahorses. It's, it's kind of fun to watch. <laughs> um, for lighting, I think there needs to be a whole lot more research with seahorses and light. You know, the general consensus amongst, among most people is that lighting is not a critical aspect. Uh, for us, we use overhead uh, fluorescent lighting and we have some spotlights for like fry tanks when we want to see certain things. Um, what we have noticed, which was kind of interesting and it was by accident, um, we noticed that any tank that was near a window with natural sunlight, the fry in there would grow faster and uh, would be uh, stronger and our survival rates were higher. The parameters for a seahorse tank are pretty much like any other tank uh, for fry systems. You want oxygen, ideally at saturation. Ideally, you don't want any ammonia or nitrites. We have found through the course of uh, unexpected fry that sometimes we have to do things in a hurry. And we've had our success rates hold where they are with uh, ammonia up to 0.5 and nitrates at, at 2 milligrams per liter. Uh, nitrates we don't even test for. Most of our fry systems are cleaned. Uh, at least twice a day, and that's most systems. That's a five-gallon bucket, so there's about three to four gallons of each cleaning. This, there's a water change. Uh, our salinity really is not critical. Most seahorses uh, can handle a wide range of salinities. Our incoming water is at 28 parts per thousand, and so that's where we target. And 
that was chosen just because it's a, the seawater is used for everything, and it was an ideal compromise uh, as far as salinity goes. Uh, temperature, ideally you want to be somewhere in the 68 to 76 degree range. In a recirculating system, you're going to find that it's better to keep them uh, in the lower 70s. The cleaner the tank, the higher the temperature you can go. But if you don't have your filtration scheme where you've got perfect water going through, the lower the temperature, the better. Um, it was interesting, we were talking earlier about FIT did a study with H. erectus, and they said that the ideal temperature range for raising the erectus on a commercial scale was at 82 degrees. And when I asked them about that, uh, told them that I thought it was at 72, we went back and forth, and they were trying to tell me I had a different species, or one seahorse from up north, and my seahorses were basically from the same area as theirs. And after a whole bunch of conversation back and forth, we finally figured out they're using a flow-through system, so they've got clean new water coming in constantly where we were using recirculating uh, systems. Uh, pH, of course, should be between 8 and 8.3. Okay, with, um, <coughs> When you decide to raise seahorse fry, you really have a choice between two types. I don't know if bending is a correct word for it, what people call uh, seahorses that will hitch right off the get-go. Um, but benthic fry will typically hitch in the evenings when you turn the lights out right away. The advantage to those is that they're much easier to raise, they're larger, uh, they're more stable at a much earlier age, and one of the great advantages is that they can take enriched artemia from day one. Pelagic fry, uh, typically we find anywhere from 10 to 20 days before they start hitching, most commonly around two weeks, and they require a much smaller food and are much, much more difficult to raise. If you're starting off on seahorses as a first timer, I highly recommend going to a benthic species and getting those down before you try to go after the pelagic species. Many people have beat their head against the wall for a long period of time trying to master the pelagic. Uh, as far as the benthic species go, these are the species that we've worked with. Uh, H. barbary, H. erectus from southern waters, uh, Zostery and Puskus, and on the pelagic side, erectus from the northern waters, Engines, Cuda, Redi, and Combs. With benthic fry, um, we start with enriched artemia. We do not use any newly hatched artemia, and the reason for that is that the uh, Newly hatched are low in the DHA component of the fatty acid profile. They're harder to digest. They've got a harder carcass. Um, we find that with the enriched artemia, they're going to be bigger, but they're softer. They're easier to eat. Um, and they're really not that much bigger. Um, they're longer, but not any wider. And we find that they, if they can take newly hatched artemia, they can normally take enriched artemia. Um, around three weeks, we begin to offer adult artemia and shade frozen mysis, and we'll slowly, well, once we start that, uh, we don't immediately cut off the enriched artemia, but we'll slowly start tapering it down. And for us, we're usually, our target is five to six weeks, they should be off uh, artemia completely. And then once they're off the artemia, we increase the size of the frozen mysis as, as they can tolerate it. Pelagic fry, on the other hand, uh, you really need to have cocoa pods or rotifers as their first food. Most people are going to try to use rotifers and artemia. Um, you'll find survival rates are going to be much higher if you can get cocoa pods. The problem is it's coming up with enough. And one of the studies done in South America, somebody actually tried to count how many food items seahorses eat, and they were doing H. redi, and they said between one to two food items per minute. And if you multiply that out with a 14-hour photo light period, you're talking about a, I mean, easily over a thousand food items per seahorse per day. And if you're doing cocoa pods, that becomes a nightmare. Um, trying to just come up with enough of it, particularly at the right size. Uh, if you're using rotor first, you want to feed at least the first three to five days with uh, rotor first. And when we've used rotor first in the past. Um, Usually on day three, after day three, we would start adding artemia in small amounts, and, and we would slowly do a shift over three or four days, switching from artemia, I mean, from rotifers to artemia. If you're using cocoa pods, the way that we do it with most of our pelagic species, uh, we really don't care what species of cocoa pod it is. Um, 
but we care about the size. We'll start off with the first three days at 120 to 330 microns. Then we go to 250 to 500 microns. And then it, by, uh, after that, up until about two weeks, we go to up to 670 microns in size. And it's important to have the right size of food because the amount of energy it takes and the amount of nutrition they get. If they want cocoa five at, say, 500 microns versus one at 120, uh, they don't have to eat as much, and it doesn't require as much energy. Those horses will grow faster because of better food conversion ratios. Um, typically, with most of our pelagic species, around four weeks, we'll start offering adult artemia. And the primary reason that we're doing the adult artemia is, is because it's a nice, soft food. We want to get them eating a larger food item. And we'll also start with shade frozen and mysis. And again, around five to six weeks, we're looking to have them off the enriched our, uh, our team not be out completely. Okay, food preparation for seahorses. If you want to be successful with seahorses, you really have to focus on reducing your bacterial uh, counts in your, your life food cultures. And, um, I noticed from the beginning when we started to, as we progressed along, the better we got at this, the higher our success rates. The other, the other factor here is your enrichments. Um, you really need to enrich our team and motor groups correctly and with the right type of enrichment or you're just not going to have the same level of success. Um, the picture there is what we're currently using for our hatching station. I used to use five gallon cones, but I'm out of space. So it's a compromise. Those are pretty intense poachers. I, I hatch about 750,000 knots per liter, uh, much higher than you're supposed to be doing. Um, the, the, the big problem with doing Artemia, Artemia is what I like to call a dirty product, and that most Artemia cultures will have significant counts of bacteria. One of the studies that I was reading, they actually went around to different aquaculture facilities, and virtually every facility they went to had a high counts of the bacteria in the cultures. And the way around this is, is, to, is to keep everything clean. We start with decapsulated cysts, and we also start by sterilizing our vessels. Each of those vessels, every time we take down the artemia, um, I know everybody says not to use soap around fish, but we actually clean the, the uh, cones with dishwashing soap with a non-scratch uh, pad. You definitely want to use a non-scratch pad. Um, scratches will put uh, places in, in the plastic for bacteria to hide out when you're trying to clean it. Um, but we, just, we start off using dishwashing soap, and then we go after that, we come back with peroxide to give a little bit more cleaning and then cut any uh, soap residue. Um, you also should start with clean, new salt water when you start your cultures. Uh, I hear many people, and I get people all the time, to tell me they use tank water. They, because our team is so tough, they'll hatch under most conditions. What we want is the artemia as clean as possible. If you notice that cone there at the top rim, you see very little artemia. Typically, most people have a big crusting around the top. And I can look at the cone and tell how clean it is just by looking at the top of the cone. And my goal is to have none up there, but obviously you always get some. Um, the other thing that we do with our artemia is that in addition to having everything clean, including the airlines and everything else, is we use a, a product from Inbay called Hatch Control. And Hatch Control is basically uh, an emulsified oil with some antioxidants, which I suspect is vitamin C. But that's supposed to reduce the bacterial counts during hatching, and it uh, is supposed to increase the hatch rate. Um, it works very well for us. The problem is, is that they sell about a half kilo. It takes 0.1 mLs per liter to use. So, uh, Doing four liters a day, I go through 0.4 mLs a day. And the shelf life is 30 days once it's over. <laughs> so it's, fortunately, it's not too terribly expensive, but it's still, it's a product of it. The results are good enough that I continue to use it. And whenever anybody close enough nearby is willing to use it, I'll split cost with them. Um, the other thing we do, we add the hash control. I add about a 16th of a teaspoon uh, a scorpal palmitate, which is a form of vitamin C, to the vessel, and that seems to have helped a little bit as well. And our hatching cones are set at 83 to 84 degrees, 
And we do that primarily because during the winter, the summer, and different times of the year, I want my artemia to hatch on a consistent basis so that it's reliable as far as when I take it down and enrich and what have you. With our cones at that temperature using decaf and the way that we do it, our artemia begins hatching in about 10 and a half hours and usually it's about 90% hatched within 16 so that when I take down the culture vessel, we're already in star two and ready to start enriching, which we take the cultures down in 24 hours. Uh, when we take down the cultures, we go through a process where we use peroxide to sterilize them. There was a study that was done about uh, bacterial reduction of live feeds using peroxide, uh, ox uh, aquaculture actually, and we've adopted that procedure and it's made a huge difference. Um, the process basically involves putting 8,000 milligrams of uh, peroxide in, a, in one liter uh, of water with the artemia for five minutes. And when I first started doing that, you can see from the picture there, the, the, the two lines represent uh, measured out where one liter and two liters are. But at the, the one liter mark right there, the first time I did the peroxide, we had about two inches of foam. That's how dirty our product was. And I can tell how clean it is when I do the uh, peroxide treatment by how much foam there is as to how good of a job we did during the hatching process. When you do this, what's really cool about it is that most people will separate the RTV when they take the cone down. Instead, we take the cone down, we rinse the RTV and put them right in here with the water. We'll add uh, 8,000 milligrams of 35% peroxide, it's 20 ml of peroxide, right to the cone. We'll leave the aeration on for about a minute and a half to let it circulate, and then three and a half minutes with no air. And what happens is our TV under adverse conditions go, go down. So in this case, all the live viable artemia go down to the bottom. All the debris and stuff goes up to the top. And when I go to take it down, all I have to do is turn the valve on the bottom, drain it to about an inch from the top, and there's no, no uh, problem separating everything. There's a good thing I don't want up at the top. Um, the other thing is, is when you're doing peroxide treatment, you will lose some some of the artemia. According to the study, they said about 80% survive. I find that if the culture is real nasty, that's a much it's much lower than that. And when my cultures are nice and clean, it will be much better than that. Typically, about 90% of the uh, artemia remains viable. Um, for enriching artemia for seahorses, you really have to have a product that is very high, that has a high e e DHA to EPA ratio. Um, a lot of people will use all kinds of different products. Uh, I'm partial to dry feeds, particularly the Algenac series. Um, we use our own proprietary uh, product, which is called Dansby, that a lot of the hobbyists are now using, uh, which is essentially a mix of a couple of different Algenac products. It has some spirulina, and some nature of those, and then a couple of herbs in there. And then we have it with and without beta glucan. What's nice about the Algemac series is that the Algemac 3050, for example, has uh, a little over 50% of the product is fats. Um, and of that, about 43% of it is the DHA component and uh, about just under 3% of the EPA. And that's important because uh, our team will rapidly convert DHA to EPA. And if you're not using a product that has a high DHA value to it, then the, the animals aren't getting the DHA component. Um, we also, in the enrichment process, we add a scorpal palmitate to the enrichment uh, when we're setting up our uh, enriching. And the scorpal palmitate is used because it's a form of vitamin C. Our team are readily converted over to free ascorbic acid. And ascorbic acid is a uh, great immunostimulator. Um, for our team, it takes 12 hours to to pack the gut as far as enriching goes, but 24 hours will increase the value of the enrichment dramatically because the first 12 hours is packing the gut and the next 12 hours they're assimilating some of that into their tissues. And some of the studies that I've looked at um, show that the artemia can be almost twice as nutritious at 24 hours as opposed to 12. Um, and then somewhere between two to six hours, normally closer to two hours, when we're taking down our enrichments, those are the uh, round containers that you see on the counter there. Um, 
we'll add uh, a pro guy called Sam White from Enve, uh the Mike F ver version. Um, those enrichment vessels, the round enrichment vessels, are basically cookie jars from Walmart. Those are called two gallon cookie jars, but they hold about 11 liters of water. And they've worked very well for us in the tight space area. I prefer to use larger vessels, but I just don't have the space. Um, when we take down the artemia, what we try to do is we try to take it down and feed it immediately. Um, it doesn't always work out that way, so sometimes we have leftover. If you have leftover artemia, you can store it in the refrigerator. The uh, cold, the coolness of it will slow down their metabolism and keep the nutritional value up. Oops. We've stopped using rotifers entirely with seahorses. Um, we have had success using them, uh, but our best success using the rot rotifer in our teaming combination was a 50% survival rate. Um, we took 1,200 CUDA and we got 600 to market, and that was the very best that we've done. Typically, we usually see less than a 25% survival ratio when we're using that combination. Um, rotifers have to be kept clean. They're, they too are a source of bacteria and ciliates. And there is a sterilization process where you can use peroxide much like you do with the artemia, um, but it's a much lower concentration for a little bit longer period of time. It's 40, 40 milligrams per liter at 15 minutes. Um, I had my wife try that once, and when she did it, she <laughs> she basically crashed the whole culture. Um, it takes a little bit when you, when you decide to use the artemia, I mean the uh, peroxide, you want to get a couple practice runs to get it down. Uh, I do know of people who have used this process and, and told me it works pretty well. I just don't use rotifers anymore. Um, rotifers also need to be enriched with a good uh, high health product as well. For plastic fried cocoa pods is the way to go. Um, the survival rates will be higher. The problem is you can never culture enough. Um, particularly with, with Blagic Pride that have such high uh, counts with their brews. And you'll see typically with raising Blagic Pride, the more cocoa pods you have, typically the higher their success rate is going to be. Um, and when we're feeding, we're, we're more concerned, as I said before, about size. And to me, the most ideal food is going to be wild zooplankton which is actually their natural diet. The problem is, of course, for most people, unless you live on the coast, it's pretty much out of reach. And unless you live down south, you're not going to be able to do it year round. The adult artemia, we, uh, it, uh, that's a 30 breeder that you see there in the picture. Um, we get a shipment of adult artemia each week from one of the suppliers down in Florida. It's cheap and readily available to us. We like using it. Um, it's basically like a living capsule. We can enrich it in any way that we want. And it's a great in-between food for us until we get them completely on frozen. One of the things that we've found through, through time is that even though we can get them on the frozen real quick, we find that keeping live foods going to them, our survival rates stay up if we don't uh, completely eliminate the live foods. Um, with seahorses, anybody has seahorses, you plan on having a lot of pros and mices, you need to find a real good supplier where you get a quality product when it comes in. Um, quite often I've seen, I've gone into fish stores, I've even ordered stuff before where the mices comes in and it's really brown in color. And your mices should be very, very light colored. If it's brown, it's it's been uh, defrosted, refrozen, or the fatty acid profile is already shifting in there and it's spoiling. Um, we only use saltwater varieties of mices with our seahorses. I know PE mices is a favorite product among many people. I don't have anything against it, per se, but uh, talking with some researchers at a couple of places that uh, do other fish told me that they've seen the higher counts of uh, uh, fatty liver disease when they use PE mices. And when I sit down and think about it and look at the uh, predator forms that are fed a lot of life, freshwater feeders, they too have fatty acid, uh, fatty liver problems. And we just, for, for that reason, we've stuck with primarily high carry mices 
and I've never, in the nine years we've been doing that, I've never had fatty liver disease issues. Um, frozen vices, particularly if you buy large quantities, you really need to have as cold as possible in your freezer. Our freezer is at minus 14 C, and we go through cases of mice and buy it by the cases. Um, it, even in a regular freezer that's just below freezing, the fatty acid profile will shift, and it, it can actually spoil still even while it's technically frozen. You really have to have a deep freeze to keep it from going bad. Um, and using frozen mice, we, when we feed our seahorses, uh, we keep it off the bottom of the tanks as much as possible. Um, sometimes food will hit the bottom, but ideally what I don't want is after feeding is to have food left laying on the bottom. And when you've got tanks with lots of seahorses, that becomes a problem because sometimes it'll take me up to a half hour to feed a tank that has a high count of seahorses in it because I'm constantly shoveling in food. And it's pretty impressive when you're sitting there doing that and you go through as much food as we do, sometimes a quarter of a pound in a feeding, just to see all that food just disappear. Um, we don't attempt to enrich our frozen mices. I know there's a lot of components for doing that. The problem I have with it is if you put something on the outside of it, you dump it in the water, and then it, it pollutes the water. So if we want to enrich, we'll use the adult uh, artemia for that purpose. And then um, we typically defrost about two pounds of mice instead of whack. And we don't use it all right then and there. So as a preservative, we'll take a little bit of ascorbic acid powder Typically about a quarter of a teaspoon, add it to the water that the mices are in, stir it up, and the mices will stay fresher, it won't turn as quick. And we typically, um, we, have, we normally have to defrost mices a couple times a day. We try not to let it sit overnight in the fridge, we'll dispose of it. Um, our daily routine, um, we, we start off around 7 o'clock in the morning. Uh, prepping our foods, doing the artemia cultures and what have you. Uh, around 8 o'clock or so, we'll, we'll turn the lights on and start our walkthroughs, where initially we go through and inspect everything, uh, look at the broodstock tanks, make sure there's no fry, uh, all the tanks get cleaned and siphoned, we empty, empty and clean all the, the skimmers, the canister filters, and when we're done, we'll top off all the sumps. Um, I mentioned the collecting the fry that's uh, broodstock tanks for those of you that are wondering, not something else. Um, and then we, then we commence our first feeding. And then about every three hours or so, we'll go through and do our feedings um, and check everything as we go through. Um, the, I'd like to say it's every three hours on the money, but realistically, with the other things that, we, that come up and priority management, since we're so short staffed, we typically, Anywhere from two to four hours is our normal routine, but we do it many times through the day, and we'll, we'll switch turns back and forth on who does it. Um, our fry tanks are scrubbed about every three days. We actually take a non-abrasive pad and go through and scrub the entire tank. Um, the picture you see to the right is a tool that we use for cycling the tanks. That's, all that is is a micro vacuum attachment uh, on some tubing. And you can get those at Home Depot in the shop back section and then go back to plumbing and get the tubing. But when you're cleaning a fry tank with our TV inspector down, instead of using an open line trying to suck everything up, the little brush really makes a big difference in keeping the bottom clean. Um, and then we just replace them as needed. And then of course we go through our other processes of sterilization. All those canisters get sterilized. Uh, other things as well. We order supplies. 12 to 2, we'll go through our local deliveries and then we start ship, start a shipping process around 3 p.m. And in the evenings is when I usually get to build new systems, do work uh, on, on things. And around 8, 9 o'clock in the evening, we'll do our final feeding. And then around 10 o'clock, we'll do our final walkthrough and double check everything and then turn the lights out. Weekly, some of our systems, like the fry systems, don't need water changes as much. Our brood stock systems, we're a little bit more, uh, don't get quite as much siphon because there's not as much stuff, so they need water changes. We add buffer to each system every week with uh, high stocking densities and the amount of nitrification that happens inside the tanks, the uh, pH will start dropping quickly because your nitrifying bacteria will consume the buffers. So yeah, you really have to watch the, the pH in the systems and add buffer on a regular basis. 
Uh, our boot swap tanks we clean about once a week, and then I like to go through and clean the sump cell about once a week when possible. Okay, um, those of you who have raised for fry and, and have looked into it and all have heard of the floaters. Um, there's really two types of floaters that you'll get with seahorses when you have newborn fry that go into a tank. And this is typically with the new fry and more so with the pelagic fry than the benthic. And the two types are, one is they get caught up in the surface tension of the water along the meniscus along the edge, or they end up with air bubbles that are hyperinflated. Both of these are preventable. When I first started doing seahorses, we had, we dealt with them like everybody else. And um, the, uh, the air bubbles or the hyperinflation, what we tried to do was we set up an experiment where we took and put some screening over the tank where the rootstock was submerged, the fry was submerged, and we let them have their fry and never let them get to the surface because I was told that if they snick air, they're going to get air bubbles. Well, they never went to the surface, but I ended up with a few hundred fry stuck to the bottom of the screen because they all developed an issue with the hyperinflation. So I realized that wasn't the answer. It wasn't the snicking of the air. And then um, somewhere along the line, I don't know exactly where I came up with the idea, but I found, or I believe, that if we could clean up the food, we could reduce the hyperinflation issues. And we started doing that, and we started seeing less uh, fry with air bubbles. And then I read an article that was in the very first issue of Coral Magazine where Wolfgang Mai talked about seahorses developing uh, bacterial infections in the digestive tract, which caused hyperinflation of the air bubbles. And that coincided with what we, what we came up with. And since we've gone to the process of what we do with the artemia, um, I can't tell you the last time I've seen any uh, fraud with uh, air bubbles or hyperinflation. And on the surface tension, when you get caught there, a lot of people like to use the prices to avoid that. But if you take the adult seahorse, the broodstock, and give them and condition them correctly, and they're producing good fry, it's not an issue. Uh, I see very few of those. And if, when I do see them, if they're eating, I ignore them, and they, they eventually come down in the water with no problem. Uh, the key there is, is the feeding. You want to keep their diet up. You want to keep them adequately fed and you want the right nutritional profile. Um, it was interesting, one of the uh, uh, papers that I read out of Australia, um, <coughs> did an experiment where they took and fed the rootstock live mice, and the experiment was to check against, I think it was artemia versus, uh, adult <coughs> artemia versus live mice versus enriched live mice. And they took an enriched uh, artemia nopii, fed it to the live mice, and then they fed that horse to the seahorses. And in the end, what they found was this, the broodstock that ate the live mice that were enriched with a high huffle product had larger fry, higher survival rates, and less issues with them uh, getting stuck at the surface. Um, scratching is a problem that you'll see with many uh, seahorse tanks, particularly with, with benthic fry, like Erectus. We'll start off on day one, we'll add some formant to the system. And that prevents when you see they take the tail up and flick the back of it, looks like they're flicking the back of their head. Um, we had one ml for every 10 gallons using 37% uh, formalin. And we'll do that every other day for three times right off the get go. And then after that, anytime that we see scratching. With the plastic species where we're using primarily copepods, um, we won't add it right away. We'll wait until we start seeing scratching and then we'll start using uh, formalin. And seahorses are very tolerant of formalin. We've um, found that they can handle up to two times the, the recommended dose and um, done every day instead of every third day. So they're pretty tolerant of it. Um, some of the other complications you can have is uh, bacterial infections. Most commonly you'll see with raising seahorses, one of the uh, very common problems is the tail rot issue where the tips of the tail start turning white. Um, our protocol is anytime we see an animal in the tank that doesn't look right, we call it. Um, we don't have the, the time or the space to set up a whole bunch of hospital tanks. Um, and we're more concerned about the, the, the vast majority of the, the animals. So we really don't try to do much in the way of treatment. 
Um, the only exception to that is if we have a new species or a species that we need to raise from broodstock and we have a hard time getting those right, then, then all bets are off. We'll do what we have to to save the batch. Um, the, the key to this, though, is to improve your water quality and flow. Um, what I found is that over time, the more we clean up the water, the more we focus on removing organics, um, the less issues that we have in terms of bacterial issues. Um, vitamin C can be used in bacterial cases of bacteria. Um, calcium ascorbate, can be, which is a form of vitamin C, can be added directly to the water at 50 milligrams a liter twice a day. Um, that helps, but what helps even more is to load up feed them light artemia and load it up with a scorbyl palmitate and feed that to them. As far as antibiotics go, uh, I think antibiotics are used too much in the world of aquaculture. Uh, much of the aquaculture community is trying to get away from using antibiotics. We try to. Um, when possible, I prefer to not to use them at all. Um, if you are going to use any antibiotics, the easiest way to do it is to gut load the artemia with it uh, instead of doing the water. If you do water treatment, bath therapy with antibiotics, now you're talking about if you do it the correct doses, you can wipe out your biological filter. And when you've got a large batch of fry, that's, it's almost impossible to keep up with water changes to handle it. Um, Palchip is something else that's commonly encountered with seahorses. Um, with us, we see very little of it. Back when I first started, there was a big controversy about using protein skimmers in seahorses, and, and that protein skimmers would cause gas bubble disease. And what we found was the exact opposite. As we started deploying protein skimmers, the, the incidence that we would see with pouching the semen had dropped significantly. So we, 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 virtually every tank has a protein skimmer on it. And if you keep the water clean, you'll see that this goes away almost entirely. We see maybe one, despite having literally thousands of seahorses, we might see one or two cases where we get air in a pouch on, on an annual basis. Um, when you do have it, a simple pouch evacuation usually does the trick. Um, and in persistent cases, then uh, irrigating the pounds with some clean, new salt water to flush it, flush it out usually solves that and focus on cleaning up the water quality. Some people will recommend using Diamox to flush the pounds. Our experience has been in dealing with customers that clean new salt water works just as well. Um, gas bubble disease, a lot of people call pouch and the gas bubble disease, but when I speak of gas bubble disease, this is where they get air trapped in the body, underneath the skin, usually around the tail of the eyes. Um, again, it goes back to water quality. In almost every case that uh, I see this with people, I can trace it back to too much organics in the water column. Uh, as far as treatment, Diamox is very good at reducing the bubbles. It doesn't cure the problem, but it reduces the symptoms. And that's done at 250 milligrams for 10 gallons for three to five days until the bubbles are gone. Um, sudden or steady die-off that occurs, um, our method is to, in handling, we, we generally don't have a big issue with this, but every now and then you'll see a case where, you, where the seahorses start dropping. And when that happens, anytime you see a suspect uh, specimen in the tank, we call it. We don't take any chances. We don't want any cross-contamination. We don't want the whole, the whole batch to go down. So if we do that, we put a hard focus on the water quality and try to determine whether we're dealing with a bacterial or parasitic issue and uh, treat accordingly. Any questions? Does the form formal and treatments wipe out your biological filter? No, not those doses. If you were doing the uh, short-term bath where they do a much higher dose, then yes, that would. But uh, the filtration scheme that we're using, even when we've doubled up on the formula, we see no hit on the biological. The peroxide you're using, what concentration is that? I get peroxide at 35% from a local chemical company. And it's cheap. It's about eight bucks a gallon. And nice, it's an industrial version of peroxide. Um, for a lot of you around different parts of the country, it can be hard to source. Usually you'll look for a chemical supply or janitorial. If you don't have either of those, your next cheapest way is to go to a um, beauty salon products dealer 
and get the uh, clear developer, which is, I think the strongest you can get there is what they call 40 volume, and that's 12% peroxide. And instead of doing 20 mLs, it's one third of the strength, so just do 60 mLs and do the same thing. I've done that when a chemical supply has run out. I usually buy a case of uh, peroxide and a wax, but every now and then I'll go up there and they'll be out of stock. And then I go to Sally's beauty supply and they look at me fine and find about uh, three or four gallons of <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. You yes. mentioned uh, using a buffer. Uh, yes. What, what, what do you like to use for a buffer? Um, I, currently, I'm using a Ken product. Uh, I used to get uh, sodium bicarb from a chemical supply, and I stopped using bicarb because I've had two or three instances where when I used regular bicarb, it didn't dissolve in the water correctly, and I ended up with uh, mortality basically due to the gills getting clogged up with the particles in the water. So I try to use something that dissolves completely. I do dissolve it before I add it to make sure it is dissolved. But at the moment, I don't know if brand matters or anything like that, but I'm just using the Kent Super ETH buffer. Uh, your sump picture. The Colchis media was kind of obscure to talk about like four. But I, I take it that you've got some other smaller little little pump that's re, re pumping the water up and down into there? Um, it depends upon the system I'm using. <coughs> if I'm using the typical 20 gallon sump like that, I have uh, most commonly I'll use the Lifeguard uh, 4000 series pumps. And I'll put a T on with, with valves so that I can divert some of the water to the colonists and some to the tank. The advantage is, is that during the feedings, I have to flow down very, very low on the tank. So all that extra water is going through the colonists media, really churning it out. Okay, so that was the T that we saw on the upper left hand of the picture. That's, um, that's where you're recirculating your water back into the colonists media? Yeah, you can see that picture. Okay.
Um, I, um, so some sponge filters in some tanks, but um, not many. Do you make much use of sponge filters? I don't. Um, the, the tank that you're, the picture, what you're referring to, um, in the very beginning, we did it that way. And the problem, I'll show you in the picture.